Is Siri racist? Are computers racist? What does that mean for a world where increasingly computers are doing human-like things? Today we're talking with Ivan Lee, the founder of Datasaur. He's the right person to talk to about this because Datasaur is the best way AI and machine learning engineers can label text-based training data. Labeling is how humans and software engineers actually train computers to do the magic they do. If our future will be run by AIs, then you can think of his software as the AI trainer. Just like training a human intelligence, what you feed your AI matters a lot. That's what we're gonna talk about now. Let's go raise some really good machines. Let's get started. Ivan, thanks for coming on the channel. Great to be here, Gary. You're obviously a true expert when it comes to NLP and AI. You worked on the Siri team back in the day. Why don't we start with that big icebreaker, which is, um, is Siri actually racist? <laughs> the answer to that is definitely a no. I think what is happening is that as we have been training and building out AI, we're starting to notice that it's a mirror. It's a reflection on our society. So with all this AI, when you teach it based off of what we've published in our newspapers, online, through our messages, whatever we're teaching it, it's starting to reflect back how we as a society function. One of the things I've been really obsessed with lately is I'm uh, brushing up on my Baudrillard and uh, you know, in his book, Simulacrum and Simulation, that's one of the things he's sort of pointing out that all of society is um, increasingly controlled by signifiers. We do things because of sign value. And these are really, they don't exist on their own. They exist as initially signifiers of uh, what's actually out there in society. So to the extent that human beings have racist thoughts or biases, and if you ever take unconscious bias training, you'll be shocked to find out like actually everyone has that. That is what uh, the AI and the AI models are really picking up. Like these things are really, they're almost mirrors to the behaviors and even down to the level of the speech of human beings. So AI itself is not inherently, you know, one way or another. Exactly. And let's just take a step back here. I don't think this is new, a new problem even for AI itself right? If we go all the way back to, let's say, Henry Ford days, right? A period of uh, famous automation in human history. We're talking about Henry Ford setting up a, you know, his pipeline in a certain way. And if you set that up well, you end up with high quality. If you set that up poorly, if you have errors in how you are training your folks um, on how to build a car and you have errors there, that'll reflect in the output as well, right? So what we're seeing is really the modern day version of that just at scale and with much more powerful models, right? The problem is there's a little bit of uh, opacity when it comes to human understanding of what's going on with these AI models and how exactly it's making the recommendations to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, one of the things that is surprising when you really get to know and uh, you know, play with some of these models is it really is a black box. You know, you're feeding information in really just training data, you know, sort of as a child, a human intelligence is trained by childhood, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is trained by the data that you give it. You're only as good as the data that is actually being provided to that AI, which sort of brings us to what you're working on in Datasaur. Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing here at Datasaur. We are building out a platform where you can really just label that training data. And out of all the, the branches of AI, we focus on a branch that is specifically focused on text and the human language. And it's been really interesting. We've been working on this for the last couple of years, and we've seen such a wide diversity in use cases because human language is such a core component of how we communicate as a society. Right. So we've seen very interesting use cases, everything from uh, healthcare and like transcripts between a doctor and a patient through to customer support calls uh, through to, yes, uh, at home digital assistance. Right. And what you need to, to train and um, teach some of these uh, assistants at home. So I've been taking a step back. I wanted to ask more about, you know, what do you think 
the future is for AI. You know, at the beginning of this, we started talking a little bit about could AI be racist on its own? Um, answer, no. You know, there's so many other places where really this technology is at the core of a lot of decisions, decisions that some decisions we have control over, others that are, you know, beyond us that institutions sort of implement. How do you think about that? What is the future role of AI and what should we be thinking about? That is a big question, Gary. Um, It's one that is very controversial and much talked about in the world right now. We've got countries from China to the European Commission to here in the US, lawmakers trying to figure out how do we regulate AI. I want to point to one particular scenario where that's been getting a lot of attention recently. We work in natural language processing, um, the area of AI that's focused on text. There's one situation that's really well suited. Uh, We have a number of folks who are using uh, NLP to read all the resumes that are coming in. And at first glance, that sounds like a great use case, right? You can um, process tens of thousands of resumes, uh, show the ones that are really most promising. But we discovered some issues once we rolled this out into production. Because uh, what happens is, let's say a company has historically uh, hired and over-indexed on men. What the AI learns by accident is that people named James and Bruce might get hired more, uh, it might be more effective at the company. And that's not what we intended to train it, right? So we quickly realized that there was this sexist bias to the AI. So data scientists tried to resolve that by removing the names from the resumes. But it introduced this other layer where now there might be a bias, let's say more men with resumes uh, list that they like golfing, right? So now the hobbies and interests works as a secondary indicator that this person might be successful. And that's not what we're trying to train the AI to learn at all. So we have to be really careful about how we build and implement this AI. We have to really inspect the data that we're feeding it and what exactly it's taking away uh, from these examples. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Basically, it, it, the training data matters a lot is, you know, what I'm getting, taking away from this. And it requires humans with human intelligence to have that discernment because otherwise the potential for unintended consequences is pretty large when um, you're implementing AI systems uh, in really any context. That's right. I guess the best way to understand what's going on is actually even just take a look at a demo. I wonder if you could walk me through what data sort of looks like. A lot of people might not have ever seen the what it looks like to train a NLP model. The interesting thing for me is that not only can you help NLP models get quite a bit more accurate and much more useful through better data, but you can actually use your own uh, AI models to improve the labeling. And so it sort of turtles all the way down. Yeah. Absolutely. That was really the goal um, in starting Datasore, right? We recognized that many companies, when it came to just the label data itself, they were just using spreadsheets. Even at Apple, with all of our resources, I was still resorting to basic spreadsheets to, to label all this text data. So I knew we could do better. And so what we've built out here at Datasore is the ability to not only have a really comprehensive interface that allows you to set up whatever kind of NLP task you'd like, but we also build intelligence in, as you alluded to. Here we've loaded a basic news text article from CNN. And what we're going to do today is just label some basic entities in this article. And that way we will teach an AI algorithm how to identify the interesting entities from this article in the future. So what we can do is uh, select basic things like CNN and label this as an organization. We can call the Caribbean a location and St. Vincent as another location. And Datasort also allows you to draw arrows from one entity to another and even label the relationship between these. So we can say St. Vincent belongs to the Caribbean. But in addition to all these kind of basic labeling capabilities, we also use AI itself to speed this process up. So we shouldn't have to label basic things like Starbucks and Saturday and London from scratch. We can actually use AI and predict everything that existing models already know. So you can see here, it's capturing things like Friday and Twitter and Facebook, and it applies everything that AI already understands about this article. And now the human labeler just has to go through and label and validate 
or reject whatever the AI has predicted there. But it's really cool to see how better tools, frankly, just need to exist. And, you know, a lot of people probably just focus on the models themselves and they're not thinking about the tooling, really. But one of the more interesting things that I learned from, you know, sort of studying the Facebook engineering team is actually one of the core uh, values that they have is they actually try to invest a large percentage of their engineering team into just the tooling that makes the engineering team more successful. So it makes sense that you would need best of breed kind of tools like that for AI and AI models. And so this also makes it accessible to any team, not just the teams at world-class places like Apple or Google or places like that. That's right. The analogy I often like to use is you wouldn't have your designers working on Microsoft Paint, right? You want to give them powerful, modern, best of breed tools uh, in order to do their work efficiently. When it comes to labeling, I think people uh, underestimate what an important part of the model training process this is. There are surveys, industry surveys, showing that these data scientists are really spending like more than half of their time just roping that data in, cleaning it up, labeling it so that they can feed it into their into their uh, models. Um, so we're trying to make that part a lot easier. We're trying to build best practices in so that it can be a lot more powerful and a lot easier to set up and get going. Makes sense. So Datasaur is available now. And um, you know, who's sort of like the ideal person to be using it? A lot of our um, users are essentially data science teams, right? Machine learning teams who they uh, are hired by their company. They're excited to try out some of the latest models, you know, uh, fine tune these parameters, but then they get bogged down by this specific element of the, the machine learning cycle, which is the, the labeling um, portion. Uh, they're the ones who are usually most excited to discover that there's already a commercial tool existing for this. Um, they sign up and then uh, it just streamlines this part of the process for them. Aside from that, are you hiring right now? <laughs> yeah, it's been a really exciting couple of months. Um, I think, you know, we finally uh, hit an inflection point um, in where we were at in, in the industry. Yeah, we're hiring across all roles. Um, would be excited to speak to anybody watching this video. So software engineers, product managers, um, designers, you know, almost sales any. folks, really across all departments. We're growing pretty rapidly these days. Well, thanks for sharing um, really sort of the state of the art of what everyone should be using for NLP today. Taking a step back, I mean, one of the things I like to ask about is a lot of the people watching here also, you know, very, sometimes very early in their careers, they want to be doing what you're doing now. Uh, what advice would you give to sort of 20 year old version of yourself just starting out? You know, you decided to follow tech, but what did you have to learn the hard way? I think something that I personally value a lot is curiosity. This is something that I screen for um, in the folks that join my company. It's something that I wish, you know, I would have been, if anything, more curious. Uh, because what's interesting about today's world is 95% of all human knowledge is recorded on the internet, right? It's available through channels like your own, Gary. And people can really dive in and learn anything that they want. So I find that the most important single most important characteristic is curiosity, the willingness to dive deeper, learn things for yourself, figure out, go into that rat hole on the internet and learn everything about a specific area, right? And by doing that, I think you set yourself up for success. I find that data and kind of learning is a snowballing process and we have to invest in ourselves. Ivan, thanks for coming on the channel. Learned a lot about the future of NLP and especially labeling. So if you're watching and you're really interested in basically helping us order all human knowledge through NLP. This is the place to really you know, reach out to Ivan, uh, try Datasaur, and thank you so much for just sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you, Gary.